Okay, everyone. I think we can get started. We have a pretty good uh, number of participants and they have an interesting topic ahead of us. So let me thank everyone for uh, joining us today. I am Ramesh Narayan and I'm going to host this event where the primary speaker is going to be Andrew Shea. So this is the third in a series of uh, webinars that we have been running on VLBI data analysis connected with the Event Horizon Telescope. Now this is part of the BH Pyre program. And as probably many of you know, there is a summer school planned August 3rd to 7th in Mexico. And these webinars are kind of to give you the introduction so that you can get more out of the summer school. Now the exactly how the summer school is going to work given the current uh, situation around the world is not clear. Just stay tuned, we will uh, let you know once we know exact details, whether the summer school is going to happen, whether it will be remote, participation, whatever. Now, I should tell you that if you check the chat site, you will find details on upcoming uh, webinars. Please do sign in for those. Previous webinars are also available on YouTube. So please uh, get those details again from the chat site. And uh, Finally, I think it's very important that before you sign off at the end of this presentation, that you do give us feedback. This is what allows us to make these webinars really useful for everyone. So any feedback we get from you is extremely useful and will help the future presentations. So the plan is today's event will go for an hour. I'm going to mute myself as soon as I finish talking and I would ask all of you to also mute yourselves. Also stop your video if you have it on so that we are not limited by bandwidth. We will let Andrew Shale give his presentation. You can ask questions through the chat along the way. I will try to keep monitoring that. Mostly I intend not to in interrupt the talk, but if something is particularly urgent, I will ask Andrew to answer. But in the normal course, we would let him speak and then we'll have maybe five, 10 minutes at the end for question and answer. And you know we'll take that as it comes. We will plan to stop with a few minutes left before the end of the hour so that you can fill in your feedback forms. So our uh, facilitator today is Dr. Andrew Shale, who is a NASA Hubble Fellowship uh, Program Einstein Fellow. He's at Princeton University in the Center for Theoretical Studies there. He received his PhD from Harvard University Physics Department. And he's actually an expert in two different fields. One is imaging techniques, how to convert VLBI data into images, uh, how to do it robustly, the techniques for that, in fact, the software for that, he is one of the primary developers of the EHT imaging software library. And this is the topic he's going to be discussing today, how to, how to make images from VLBI data. But he has another part side to him. He's also an expert in numerical simulations of black hole accretion. I think he's not planning to say anything about that today, but that's another area where he is quite an expert. So I will uh, shut up at this point. I will let Andrew give his talk, and then I will uh, talk to everyone at the end of his presentation when we go into the question and answer. So I'm going to mute myself now. So Andrew, you can take it away. Great, uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Ramesh, and thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, I know that now is a difficult and uncertain time, so thank you all for making the time for this um, webinar. So the basic purpose of this webinar as Ramesh mentioned was to, is to get you sort of up to speed on VLBI imaging techniques. So it'll be a pretty um, ground level introduction to the ideas behind VLBI imaging. To hopefully get you prepared to um, start experimenting with different imaging software packages and different techniques um, in preparation for the summer school. And as, as Ramesh said, if you could please at the end of the talk, fill out the evaluation survey. Uh, the link is here at the bottom. Um, I think it's also been shared in the chat. And I'll show it again at the end. 
Um, okay. So the outline for today's talk um, is that we'll first review the basic principles of VLBI, which have been discussed in the last two webinars. Um, then I'll go into sort of a high level overview of two basic um, two frameworks for VLBI imaging. Um, one is the clean methodology, which is uh, standard, well-tested, old school approach, which has been used for many years. And one is the RML, um, regularized maximum likelihood methodology, which has been proved really fruitful um, for uh, the HT in particular, and which we've been developing a lot um, for the last few years, and which, as Ramesh mentioned, uh, I spent a good chunk of my thesis working on. Then I'll talk a little bit at the end if, about validating an image, how important it is to subject an image that you have to rigorous tests and to, uh, because VLBI imaging is a nonlinear and um, uncertain process to, to um, make sure that you're testing the image as much as you can at the end. And then if we have time, at the very end, I'll talk about possible sort of extensions to the basic framework I've mentioned here. Okay, so we'll start with a review of VLBI, um, which if you've attended the last couple webinars, um, this should be familiar material to you. Uh, but I wanted to start with just a really high level um, sort of motivation for why we need VLBI in the first place. Um, so looking at this picture here of the M87 um, supermassive black hole shadow that uh, was captured by the HD last year, um, we know that this thing is really massive. It's 6 billion solar masses. And so the shadow size is really big, um, 650 AU across. Um, but it's really far away. And so that means that M87 is, is really, really small, about 40 micro arc seconds in the units that we use um, for the HT, which if you convert to more familiar units is um, 10 to the minus 8 degrees. Um, so we can't capture this sort of image with a standard telescope. We need to use a telescope around the size of the Earth. If we just look at the lambda over D, the resolution of the event horizon telescope, we can approximate it as sort of the um, 1.3 millimeter um, frequency uh, wavelength that the EHT observes with over the Earth diameter, um, we get a resolution of about 20 micro arc seconds, so just uh, powerful enough to resolve these features. And so we really need, um, at the 1.3 millimeter wavelengths we're looking at, telescopes the size of the Earth um, to resolve black hole shadows, and therefore we need VLBI. Um, so here are some slides that I just stole from Lindy's uh, talk last week, which I thought was a really great way of sort of explaining in three slides the basic idea of what VLBI measures, and that is that VLBI does not measure directly the image intensity pattern on the sky, but it instead measures the spatial coherence of wave fronts emitted by the image. So if we have a point source here um, above two telescopes separated by a baseline U, which is the baseline divided by the wavelength, dimensionless units, um, if that point source is directly overhead, um, the two telescopes, um, if we ignore noise, will be seeing exactly the same wavefront. And so if we take the um, average of the electric field, uh, the correlation of the electric field measured at those two telescopes, we'll get just the intensity of that point source. Again, neglecting noise. If we shift it, though, this telescope on the left will see a, uh, the wavefront delayed. And so if we average it, that translates into a phase being picked up. Um, a phase proportional to the distance, um, uh, the relative distance uh, u dot um, sigma here, um, of the point source and the position and the baseline position. Um, and so we pick up this phase on the correlation between the two um, electric fields. And if we then have an extended source, we can just approximate that as a um, integral of all these different point sources across the, the sky. And so we get that our measured correlation between the two electric fields is basically the Fourier transform, the integral of these phase factors times the um, intensity pattern. Um, and we call this um, function that we measure, the spatial coherence, the visibility. Um, and this is, corresponds um, to the Fourier transform of the image. And so the problem with the LBI is that we have these visibility measurements, um, but we don't have enough of them to directly invert the Fourier transform. So we need to um, use imaging methods to so um, again, in summary, basically what we have in VLBI is two, two telescopes. Um, and each telescope measures one Fourier component on the sky. So one um, um, spatial frequency or a spatial wave um, in this decomposition of the image um, on the sky. And as the Earth rotates, and we, this is the example of the EHT, this animation created by Daniel Palumbo 
um, we pick up different um, baselines. We add different telescopes to the array as we rotate the Earth through the night. The, the orientation of the baseline vectors between sites is changing. And so we carve out different positions and we pick up different data. But you can see that we still haven't filled this entire plane. Um, so we still don't have enough data to just directly convert the Fourier transform. We need to use an imaging method. Um, and just to review basically what Lindy mentioned last week, I just wanted to emphasize that when we, all the imaging methods that we're talking about um, are using data that has already been reduced and calibrated by a tremendous amount. So the raw signals that we measure, we measure it in petabytes for the HT, the correlation and calibration reduces them to megabytes by the time the imaging methods uh, take over. Um, and so we're really working with a data product that has already been um, calibrated, um, deal with noise and systematics to an extraordinary degree. And so we're just doing the last step, um, putting it, converting this data to an image. Um, the last thing I want to mention in this intro is basically that, you know, all, this is a picture of M87 at many different scales, uh, from the EHT image um, to uh, longer wavelengths out to this large scale jet um, at many thousands of parsecs from the very large array. And I wanted to mention that all of these are images, uh, radio images from interferometers. So they're all using the basic approaches for um, the basic, they all face the basic problem of um, image reconstruction that uh, we're going to be confronting in this talk. Um, the precise you know, challenges that you face at different wavelengths uh, will be different. I'll be talking a lot about the specific challenges of the AHT at 1.3 millimeters, this very high frequency, which are different than to the VLAs methods at um, 20 centimeters, but the basic principles behind all of these are the same, and you could, in principle, use the same methods adapted for each case um, to, to each of them. And in fact, um, for the clean method, um, that was used for these three images and as well as part of the EHT image. So um, these principles are really general, even though I'll be focusing on the EHT. Okay, so with that introduction, um, I'm going to move on to talking about the basic VLBI imaging methods. So as I mentioned in the introduction, um, we don't have enough measurements to directly image. Um, so if we had the telescope, the Earth, the Earth covered with telescopes, um, we would have frequency measurements filling the UV plane, which is what we call the space of east-west and north-south frequencies. Um, and we could just directly invert the Fourier transform to get an image. But we don't have all of those telescopes. We have a very sparse collection. And as I showed before, we have this um, sparse um, sampling of this UV plane based on where we have telescopes around the Earth, um, we don't have enough data to directly invert the Fourier transform. Um, and so a way to think about this is, you know, we have sparse measurements. So in principle, um, there could be an infinite number of images which match these measurements, because we have freedom to adjust the measurements everywhere else in the UV plane. Um, as long as we match the measurements that we have obtained, um, we have freedom to you know, basically pick an, any infinite number of images. And so we have to have an algorithm to distinguish between all those infinite number of images could match the data. First of all, find one, and then find one that matches the data um, that we think is high likelihood, um, high probability of being a good, of a, a good, um, a good sky image that matches the data as well as prior assumptions that we have about the nature of images on the sky. Um, so another way to think about the problem is maybe the more classical way of thinking about the problem is that we have this um, source image. Here's a example simulation image from Avery Broderick. Um, and you, we can analytically Fourier transform it, and we just obtain the Fourier transform. We can go back and forth on our computer uh, perfectly between these two representations. Um, but when we sample the Fourier transform with our sparse coverage of our interferometer of the VLBI array that we're looking at, um, we are basically uh, the equivalent mathematical operation in the image domain is that we're convolving it with this dirty beam. So this pattern here sparse pattern of telescope um, sampling points. Um, and with the Fourier transform is this, is this messy, dirty beam, or point spread function is another way to think about it. Um, and the, we had you know, perfect, if we had perfect measurements only on these points, the direct Fourier transform of those measurements would then be the convolution of this dirty beam with the source image uh, to give this dirty image. And so you can see that in this case, the dirty image looks basically nothing like the source image. Um, the measurement and that, that dirty image is in this case the direct Fourier transform of these capabilities. And I want to emphasize this is sort of the ideal scenario where we have perfect data on all of these sparse points and the only issue that we have is sparsity. In this case, um, the direct Fourier transform gives us still a very messy image and so we have to go 
through a lot of um, work to try to turn this image into something that we think is a reasonable approximation of the source. In practice, um, this um, schematic will also be um, corrupted by a lot of different um, other factors, such as phase and amplitude um, calibration errors. Um, and I'll mention those later in the talk. So this is sort of the ideal case, um, which holds pretty well for arrays at lower frequencies, like the DLA. Um, but the EHT is not exactly the, the situation we face, but it's still the basic uh, picture you should have in mind. OK, so given that, um, given this sort of idea un underlying um, the imaging problem, we can think of one way to go about um, getting a good source image from our data. It might be to take this dirty image, the direct Fourier transform of the visibilities, and try to clean it up or try to remove all of this messy structure, which has been put on there by this dirty beam convolution um, to get at the source image. And this is the approach that's taken by the clean algorithm, which is, I say, the workhorse of, um, of interferometric imaging. Um, and it's been around for more than 40 years at this point and is used um, by many different arrays um, in many different contexts uh, with, with a lot of success. So the basic idea behind the clean algorithm is this cleaning. Um, that I t mentioned before. So we have these sparse measurements and we take the inverse Fourier transform. This is a different underlying simulation and we get this dirty image, which has all of these um, messy features from the dirty beam convolution. Then we undergo a kind of iterative process to try to, oops, try to remove the, all of this extraneous structure from the dirty beam. So we have this dirty beam and basically we try to shift around this dirty beam around this image, find the maximum point in this image and subtract this dirty beam. So we are trying to deconvolve this dirty beam from this structure. Um, and what that gets us is this sort of collection of point sources. Um, we're going around identifying point sources, subtracting them from the image. Um, we do this in a loop. Um, there are many other knobs you can turn in this loop. Um, but that's the basic idea. Um, and we get this collection of point sources at the end of the day, which should fit, um, fit your data because the Dirty image is the, this collection of point sources convolved with the dirty beam. Um, of course, this collection of point sources, if we, if we ran this loop for a, um, sort of an infinite amount of time on perfect data, we would hope that this collection of point sources, um, we can show this collection of point sources should fill out the, the image that we measure. But um, in practice, we can't do that. And so the image that we show at the end of the day is that we convolve these point sources the Gaussian. So in this case, the circular Gaussian of this size here, which represents the central peak of this dirty beam. This is the sort of nominal resolution of our interferometer. Um, and so this is sort of what we call the clean beam, um, which represents um, only the resolution degrading effect of our um, instrument and none, none of these complicated um, side lobes from the, the dirty beam. And so we can evolve this collection of point sources to get our final image, um, which in this case, um, shows us a, a blurry black hole shadow. Um, it's a pretty good job of, um, of, of deconvolving all of this messy structure from the dirty image. So the basic idea is, again, just the idea behind clean is that we have this um, inverse model approach where we have sparse measurements. We produce a dirty image from them, and we try to clean that up by subtracting off this dirty beam from it, getting a collection of point sources, and involving it uh, at the end of the day to our resolution that we expect to achieve. So like any imaging method um, or any method in general, clean has pros and cons. And I just want to like list here basically what I, I see um, and others might disagree um, about the particulars here about the pros and cons of clean as a method. And I'll do the same for RML later. So I think the pros of clean are that um, in cases of good UV coverage, this thing can um, operate um, quickly and um, basically keep going to produce images consistent with the data down to the noise level. So the way that this iterative procedure works is we go through and we find maximum points and we subtract off the beam. Um, the way this iterative procedure works is that you're burrowing down to the noise level, basically. Um, and so you can get images down to really faint structures um, quickly that um, probe really, really faint extended structures that we often see in radio astronomy. Um, sort of going along with that, each run of clean takes a very short time. So clean is deterministic. It, been running. Uh, it was designed to run on computers in the 70s, and it runs really fast on computers now. Um, and um, so you can do a clean run very quickly. You 
can do it um, with guidance manually, um, or you can run it script in a scripted fashion, um, and you can process very large images, these wide scale images of the sky. Um, and then clean is a standard time-tested method, as I mentioned, it's been used on every image that you've seen basically from the VLA, from other arrays, from ALMA. Um, and so it's standard and time-tested. Um, even in the areas where um, it has difficulty, there's been a lot of effort over decades to, to overcome them, and there's a lot of wisdom built up, and it's implemented in a lot of platforms. Some examples of those are DiffMap, CASA, and Oops. Um, some of the cons of clean, are, I would say that clean tends to break up images into these smaller features. So that's sort of built into the method. We have the fundamental representation here is this collection of point sources. Um, we often see extended features in astronomy. And so this final step of this convolution with the Gaussian is intended to try to blur together these point sources into a continuous image. Um, but that won't always work if your cleaning isn't perfect. Um, the final restored image is this convolution, but this isn't fitting the data. Actually, the fi final image that fits the data is this collection of point sources, um, which um, isn't usually what's shown because it doesn't visually look like what we expect the image to look like. So we do this final blurring section. But if we really want an image that you know, we can say fits the data with a chi squared of one, for example, the clean images um, will not do that. Um, and then the final con is that clean requires this phase calibrated data to make this initial Fourier transform from the measurements to the dirty image. Um, and the EHT and other high frequency VLBI data um, don't have this phase calibration. We don't measure the absolute phase. Um, if you went to Mindy's talk, he talked a lot about this. Um, and so we have to sort of add on this additional self calibration process to clean, which makes it even more complicated, which makes it much more complicated um, in order to handle data at these high frequencies. Um, and so the, this phase error problem is, is a big one for the EHT. And the basic way to think about this is that if we have two telescopes, we're measuring, trying to measure the relative um, delay of the two wave fronts approaching the two telescopes. Um, but we have atmosphere above both of these telescopes. Um, we have different atmosphere in the two locations, um, which can be widely separated around the world. And so each of these atmosphere um, clouds here in this schematic um, are delaying the wave by different amounts at the different locations. So we pick up this phase factor um, um, in front of our measured, uh, in front of our visibility. Um, that we measure this is the true visibility. And this can yeah, means that we're not measuring the actual phase that we, we want to measure to, to run clean properly. Um, and just to emphasize the importance of phase, here is the same image I was showing before. Um, a different image um, showing the source image convolved with the dirty beam. And with the dirty beam, um, if, if we have um, if the source image called with the dirty beam, if we have perfect phase measurements, the dirty image that we get um, from our measurements will equal this convolution. But if we don't have perfect phase information, the dirty image that we get with these uncalibrated phases does not equal the source image called with the dirty beam because the phases aren't correct. And so we get this really messed up image which looks nothing at all like the source image. We try to use this image with our completely uncalibrated phases to um, start a cleaning process we won't have any success at all because the fundamental assumption that our dirty image, the direct Fourier transform of the um, measured visibilities is equal to the source image convolved with the dirty beam does not hold if the spaces are uncalibrated. And so we have to add on some extra calibration steps to get clean to work in this case. Um, so the way that we, one of the ways we get around this um, is by using this quantity called closure phase. Um, which is basically the sum of phases around a triangle of sites. And so if you have three different sites in this case, you can sort of see how the phase delay um, at each one will, you know, if it's a plus sign in one visibility and a minus sign in another visibility. And so if you add the phases around, um, they'll cancel out in this way that the phase of all three sites um, that we measure is consistent with the actual structure of the, of the sum of the three sites is consistent with what we would measure in the absence of any of this atmospheric phase. So this closure phase that we um, talk about a lot for the HT um, is our most robust observable for the phase structure of our data. And, um, so you'll hear the word closure phase a lot because it's one of the fundamental data properties we measure. Um, similarly, we have a similar problem with amplitude gain errors. Um, so I would say that the, that the um, 
phase errors um, that we have the atmospheric phase that I've been talking about is the more hopeless case um, for the EHT that we have no direct phase measurement um, on uh, a baseline basis. Um, whereas the um, amplitude case, you know, we have pretty good in a lot of cases estimate of what the amplitude is, but in principle, we still have all of these uncertainties that different telescopes can be calibrated differently and therefore introduce different um, calibrate incorrectly um, and therefore introduce different um, gain factors into our measured visibility. So if we look at the measured visibility uh, compared to the true visibility, we can in principle not only have this phase term, which is from the atmosphere, but also these different gain terms, um, which scale the visibility up or down as a, um, on the two, based on how well or poorly we have estimated the sensitivity of our different telescopes um, at the different sites. So these gain terms aren't as drastic, they're often close to one um, for our well-performing sites in the EHT, but sometimes they can be really far from one. And so we don't necessarily um, want to trust directly the amplitudes of our visibilities right away in the EHT. And then we have a similar quantity to the closure phase called closure amplitude that deals with this problem. And so when we think about it is we have like four sites, um, as long as we take a ratio of visibilities between these four sites, so that every site is represented once in the numerator and every site is represented once in the denominator, all of these gain terms will cancel out in that final ratio. And for that, um, quantity of the closure amplitude is often what we use um, in imaging to, uh, as our sanity check, that we are um, uh, matching our fundamental data product that doesn't, isn't corrupted by these gain as I mentioned, these gain factors often are close to one. Um, we can often trust the, um, the amplitudes directly that we measure um, and make small adjustments compared to the very large and completely unconstrained adjustments that we have on these. Um. Okay, so to deal with this amplitude and phase calibration issue, CLEAN has to add an extra step, which is a self-calibration loop. Um, so I won't get into the details of how this works, but basically the idea is that before we can even start CLEAN, we need to have some guess of the calibration. We need to um, try to narrow, to, to nail down these gain and phase factors. And the way that we do that is we have some initial guess of the source structure. So we try to fit these calibration, um, these gain um, and phase terms to, um, to match what they would be, have to be to give us the measured data from a initial guess of the source structure. Often this is taken as a point source and then we can run clean. We hope that this initial guess is close enough that we're not going to get a completely wrong answer with clean, um, that our dirty image will approximate the true dirty image. Um, we run clean, um, we do this loop, and then we sort of recalibrate. So we sort of bootstrap in a way that takes this final image and recalibrates the phase um, amplitude gains, um, adjusts the data, and then restart the whole process. And we hope that this can converge to a reasonable kind of solution. Um, but the, as you might imagine, this has a lot of, um, it's the final solution that we get will depend a lot on our initial calibration guess and also how often we're doing this, this calibration, um, and how we alternate the calibration with the, with the emission loops. Okay, um, so that was the, uh, a sort of lightning introduction to the clean, to the clean approach. Um, and now I'm gonna talk, shift gears and talk about another approach, which is what we call regularized maximum likelihood. And so the philosophy behind this approach is, um, I'd say, different, uh, different way of thinking about the imaging problem than the clean approach, where if you remember, the clean approach is taking the um, dirty image and trying to clean it up, trying to do this inverse model um, cleaning of a dirty image that we've obtained. Whereas the um, RML approach is based on sort of a Bayesian model in, um, inversion idea, where instead of thinking about cleaning up uh, um, a measurement that we've made. We think instead about if we have a trial forward, if we have a trial image, we take any image from sort of a set of all possible images, um, can we run that image through a forward model to generate synthetic data? So this forward model should contain all the different details about our, um, our, proximate, uh, our best guess of modeling of all of our different effects of our, of our array. So the, the sparse sampling of our different telescopes, the noise um, of uh, uh, calibration errors, um, and we can get a synthetic data. And given, the, given that set of synthetic data measured from our trial um, image, um, we can compute a likelihood 
or probability that um, if this image um, were the truth, that the data that we actually measure, the data that's come from the true image and gone through our actual array, will um, have come from this trial reconstruction. Um, and a great feature about sort of this approach um, is that in this likelihood, we can incorporate all of the different effects in our forward model of, um, of calibration um, and systematics that we can't um, address directly in the same way in clean. So we have, for instance, we can include, we can compare directly to the measured data that we have, um, like closure amplitude and closure phase, which are robust to um, the um, atmospheric and gain um, errors. Or we can try to model the atmospheric and gain model, uh, um, errors directly and include them um, as part of the parameters that we're solving for. Um, of course, um, this likelihood will still um, doesn't distinguish between all the different infinity of possible images which could fit the data perfectly, even our, even more so with our robust quantities like closure phase and closure amplitude, we have even more images that can fit them because they can less information than the ideal set of complex capabilities. Um, and so we have images, like in this case, which could fit this simulated data. All these images do a reasonable job of fitting the data. Uh, but you can see that some of them, we might expect a priori to be better fits. Um, I mean, to be more reasonable um, um, reconstructions than the others. We might ex expect in this case, for example, these two, um, the ad, um, lower left and upper right here to um, correspond more to what we expect from an astronomical image in that they're compact. They have um, near zero intensity outside of the central region. They don't have large ripples. They don't have negative values um, in their intensities critically like this one on the bottom does. Um, and so we can use all these different physical, um, uh, all, all these different uh, physical constraints on the image um, to motivate uh, a prior probability that in given image will be, be, be a, um, a good fit. And so we can say in our prior that you know, these two should be reasonably highly weighted and these two might be less weighted, um, much more lowly weighted, and have a low probability of being uh, a good reconstruction. And so then our final, um, our final score of how well an image does in this framework, um, this Bayesian framework will be this likelihood of how well the image fits the data times the prior of how well the image fits. Um, and so in the RML, regularized maximum likelihood approach that we've taken to imaging, um, we're not a strict, um, it's not a strict Bayesian approach in that our regularizing functions that we use that try to enforce these, um, the consistency of the image to our physical expectations of what the source looks like can't always be defined um, in terms of probability, uh, probability distributions. But sort of the general um, understanding of what's going on is really um, the same as in, or is, is, is driven by what's under happening in the Bayesian approach. So we have, um, instead of a prior, we have what we call a regularizing function, which um, analyzes images that, that don't fit criteria that we um, expect in a sky image that, for example, if the images have negative pixels, if the image is really far out, if the uh, really extended, if the image doesn't have really fine structure, we may penalize them. And we're combining this with a chi-squared um, goodness of fit metric that tells us how well our image is affecting the data. I'm using the sum of these two things um, weighted to, to evaluate how well a given reconstruction scores. And so this slide says basically that same thing, just in an equation that in the regularized maximum likelihood method, what we're trying to do is minimize this objective function on the image, which is the sum of all of our different data terms, uh, all these chi-squared goodness of fit metrics that tell us how well our image fits the data, um, plus all of these regularizing functions, which tells us how well the image fits our prior expectations. And it has a minus sign because of conventions, but don't worry about that. Um, so, and the, the coefficients in this sum are what we call hyperparameters, which tell us how well we weight different data terms, whether or not we um, try to push the image to fit closure phase more um, than closure amplitude, for example, um, how well we weight different regularizing assumptions. Um, these sort of hyperparameters, I would say, are the big source of uncertainty in um, 
for imaging. And one of the things that we have to do careful validation on to, um, to, to be sure about. Um, and so this is a flexible framework. As you can see, you can write down sort of any different, um, any imaging problem in this framework. Um, and so it um, enables development of new data, new regularizing terms. If you have an idea, you can just plug it into here, um, into this framework. Um, and so it's a, it's a good way to think about the imaging problem, I think. Okay, so I'll quickly show two example regularizing terms that we use in the EHT a lot. Um, one is this L1 norm. So basically in this L1 norm, we're trying to minimize the number of bright pixels. We're expecting that we can explain our image by sort of a compact number of pixels. As you can see, here's an image of M87 that fits well under this L1 norm and it's really compact. Another is this total variation, TV. Um, and this is um, trying to um, make the image smooth and prefers um, sort of flat patches sparsity in the gradient domain, basically. In this case, you can see that the TV has sort of washed out um, sharp features and is trying to make the image smoother and flatter in this image that fits the data well, but also has a high regularizer from Covert. Um, so as I mentioned before, one of the nice things about RML is that we can use the closure data directly. Um, here uh, in this slide, I'm showing what happens in sort of imaging methods that don't use this closure data directly if we increase the gain calibration error, so from 0% to 100% here on the, on the x-axis at the bottom, we see in these imaging methods um, the um, reconstruction of this source image up here looks pretty good for a little ways, but then completely fail. If we start to fit the closure data directly um, in these closure-only methods, um, we can actually achieve pretty good fits of the underlying image regardless of how poorly calibrated so this is sort of a very minimal um, set of assumptions going into um, a minimal assumption imaging that doesn't rely on calibrations. Um, as um, Ramesh mentioned at the beginning, um, RML imaging methods um, have been developed extensively for the EHT. So we, um, uh, as part of my thesis, I developed this EHT imaging package, which you can find here. Um, uh, a similar package uh, developed by Kazuo Hiyama called Smiley uh, can be found here, which does a lot of the same things, but with um, slightly different approaches in some ways. Um, and so this RML, sort of the framework for RML imaging is a big um, active area of research, I would say, in the EHT and sort of developing extensions and improvements is something that we're working on all the time. And I would say that the RML imaging methods have, we developed them for the EHT, but they have wide applicability. So here's an example of um, EHT imaging. Um, algorithm that I ran on this ALMA image of HL tau. Um, and that the very high frequency image you can see in their initial ALMA image, um, they have these artifacts that come from, we think, from the dirty beam. Um, and um, so amplitude calibration of that dirty beam. And in the EHT imaging approach, we're able to substantially mitigate those artifacts. So these methods um, were developed for the EHT, but they have pretty wide applicability. I'll skip this, but this is just sort of showing what an imaging script looks like in EFT imaging. Um, if you want to get started, um, there are some examples. Um, you can go to the GitHub here um, and see some examples in the example folder, which can walk you through different um, parts of the code. There's extensive documentation for EHT imaging, um, but this, um, I won't walk through every step, but this is just sort of show you that you know, EHT imaging, in this case, is written in Python. It's pretty straightforward um, to define an imager using this objective function approach that I mentioned before that has all these different weights um, and the data terms and regularizers and to run it and to make an image. Um, and one of the things I'm hoping to maybe use my um, next few weeks of working at home is to make a better tutorial for EHT imaging. Um, we have some examples, as I mentioned, in the example folder, which can get you started. Um, I'm gonna work on making a better online tutorial, I hope, over the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that. Okay, so any imaging method, as I mentioned before, will have pros and cons. Um, as clean does, so does EHT, uh, so does uh, regular maximum likelihood methods. Um, so I would say the pros of RML are that the forward modeling approach that we've adopted allows for flexibility in the data terms and regularizers, as I mentioned. You can sort of plug in different data terms. You can come up with them, different regularizers. If you have an idea for one of these, you can plug it into the framework um, and easily experiment with these new methods. And, use them in combination with old methods. Um, so it's really easy to, to experiment and get started with new methods. Um, 
Another is that the fundamental image representation is continuous, so we don't have this point source um, limitation of clean. Um, we can resolve structures um, uh, sort of at half of the beam scale um, because of this. Another bit is that it's easily scriptable. So as we mentioned, we've, we've um, written both the HD imaging library and the SMILE library, um, sort of new software packages. They're written in Python, um, and they're easy to, to, to script with, to play around with, to, to mess with the source code to explore jobs running, uh, looking over a lot of different imaging parameters, for example. Some of the cons of RML are that um, the convergence, um, then imaging in RML, as with clean, is nonlinear. Um, convergence will depend on having the initial conditions um, well adapted in a lot of cases. Um, this is something that often just takes experience to get used to. Um, so it's easy for people just starting off to, you know, do something that seems like a good initial condition and to fall into the local minimum. Um, and one of the ways that we've avoided that, and which I'll mention in the last part of the talk, um, is um, to, to do large parameter surveys um, and to look at lots of different parameters and see how can we marginalize over these initial conditions. Issues. Um, RML imaging is slower. It's not, um, uh, it's not the quick iterative loop that the, the clean imaging is. So it doesn't scale as trivially to large data sets really about the same for EHG data, which are, are sparse. If you're looking at really large data sets like ALMA array data or um, DLA array data, you need to uh, adapt the RML method to, to handle those. Um, and a third issue is that sort of the correlations between the non gaussian statistics on these closure quantities um, aren't yet implemented in the EHG imaging um, or in the RML methods, um, though there are So in the last, um, I guess, five minutes, um, I will talk about um, validating an image. So both clean and RML approaches to imaging have, um, as I mentioned, a lot of uncertainties, a lot of different knobs and the parameters that you can, you can tune, um, they're nonlinear. And so the image that you get at the end of the day, um, if you, even if it's a good fit to the data, might not be the unique best fit to the data or the unique um, and so to, we need to validate these images extensively, um, I would say. And the um, approach that I'm outlining here is some of the validation steps we took for the EHT images of M87. These aren't the only validation methods you could use. Um, I really want to just emphasize the importance of validation in general and using techniques adapted to your specific problem. So here are some ideas based on what we did for M87. Um, so as I mentioned, each of these different Imaging packages has lots of different free parameter knobs that you can tune. Um, and you might start out playing with on your local computer, tuning these knobs yourself, um, getting, you might get an image from with some combination of these parameters that looks good to you. But the question might be, you know, is that image just coming from the fact that you've tuned the parameters just so to get an image that you expect, or that you want to get out of it? How can we be sure that that image is generic and doesn't depend really sensitively on these um, different knobs that we've tuned? So one way to, to reassure ourselves about that is to run parameter surveys to explore the space of all these different parameters. For example, the hyperparameters in the weighting, the regularizer, and um, data terms in the RML approach um, to, to look, to run many different images, generate thousands of images, and look at the, look at the space. Um, so this is what we did for the, for the EHT imaging paper. Um, of M87, and we tested these different parameter combinations. We had thousands of parameter combinations, and we tested them on a set of synthetic sources. We demanded that our images should match, to be able to, to distinguish between these, these set of synthetic sources, um, so that you know, if we see a ring in the image, um, we can be confident that the um, imaging method, the co combination of parameters we've used on any of our different imaging um, software packages, um, that combination of parameters will be able to give us a double if there was a double and not a ring, for example. We run these different parameters. Um, we try to reproduce them. And then we choose only the parameters that do a good job of reproducing all of these images. Um, and I think in this case, it was really important that we looked at many different, um, we looked at several different source images, or able then to distinguish from different source structures. We only choose parameters that are able to reproduce all of these um, to apply to our final M87 data to get images like this. Um, so exploring a large range of parameter space um, in a given imaging method is one great way of validating your uh, 
imaging. Another one is to look for consistent features from different imaging methods. So as I mentioned, we have RML, we have um, clean within RML and clean. We have you know, different approaches, different um, software libraries, um, Smiley and EHT imaging, for example, different um, users will have different ways of, of using these um, software packages. Um, so it's good to look, um, if you have an imaging problem that's tricky, to look for consistent features from these different methods to try to run it through different software packages and see if you get the same answer. This is what we did for the um, EHT M87 results. Um, you can see here what we see across four different days um, in DIFMAP, EHT imaging, and Smiley after we've done this parameter selection across um, by looking um, at fit systematic data across a large range of imaging parameter space. We get final images different methods which are consistent in a lot of features, most notably in the fact that we see a central depression and a ring around it, um, which we interpret as this um, emission ring around the black hole. But we also see a lot of features which aren't consistent with human methods, especially these fine scale features um, at, at smaller scales, smaller than our resolution. Um, we see different um, noisy features around the edge, Actually, different features on the, on the ring here, and so we want to know which of these features are we are the most trustworthy, and which are potentially um, um, unique uh, to the imaging method, or might not be supported entirely by the data if we run it through all these different methods. Um, so, by looking at um, different methods, we can try to figure out which features are consistent, and we can also average our data together into a final image, which is what we did for the HD. So, we, in this case. We take our, our, our images from the three different packages and we blur them and average them together to get the final image, which is really trying to arrive at what we think of as a maximally conservative image. And we're not trusting any single software package in this case to um, be the, the perfect correct answer. We're trying to really only look at features that are common to all three. Um, of course, for images that are maybe a little less high stakes than this image, you might be able to push it a little harder to trust software package, um, a single software package that you've developed a little bit more. Um, but I think for, if you're really being honest, um, the most important thing is to look at different methods and see what are the consistent features. Okay, another thing that we do um, is validating with gains. So as I mentioned before, we have these gain terms which um, affect the, the true visibility. In this case, I flipped the equation around. So we're defining the gains in this case as True visibility is the gain terms times the measured visibility. It's just a convention artifact. Um, and these gains we know should be stable sort of in time and between sources. And so one thing that we can do is we can look at calibrators. So sources for the HT, for example, that were imaged at the same time as M87 and see if the gain solutions we derive are the same um, are consistent between the calibrators and the, um, the, the, the target source, in this case, M87. And so in this case, you can see that the gains um, on many of these two sites are close to one all the way through the observation on both the calibrator source, 379 and M87. On, on this site, the LMT, the gains are wobbling around by a lot, but they are doing so consistently between the calibrators and, the, um, and M87. Um, another feature about the gains, which is important to keep in mind in validation, is that usually we expect these inverse gains to be um, less than one. So telescopes are usually less sensitive than their estimates, not more. Um, in this case, the, gain, the gains is defined in this case should be greater than one. The gains defined the opposite tends to be, should be less than one. Um, a last way that we validate um, for the HD images is by omitting stations. So we want to assure ourselves that our images aren't too sensitive to any one telescope being lost or miscalibrated. Um, and for the ESG, this is really challenging because we have such a sparse array so that um, in um, a lot of cases, every site is essential. Um, I think for, for larger arrays, this, this should you know, hold for any one station. Um, should, the image should be robust to, to emitting it. For ESG, it's not always true because, for example, the Chile stations are critical to our array. But, by looking at different combinations, we can say, okay, most stations, mo the image is, is robust to the removal of um, most stations one at a time. This case on um, the lower left here shows what happens if we only use closure data. 
we've ignored all the amplitude calibration in our final image, and we can see that in this case actually the image looks consistent with the with the image we get when we include amplitude information, which is the okay. Um, so that's sort of just to say the importance um, of validating an image. Um, I'll very quickly talk um, about some extensions to imaging. Um, just to give you an idea of how we can extend this framework. One is in polarization, so light doesn't have just an intensity, it has a direction. It's actually what gravity is. Andrew, we are running yeah. out of time. Yeah. We need a little time for questions. Great, okay, so I will just say two seconds about each of these extensions. One is polarization, um, one is multi-frequency imaging, looking at connecting images um, across different frequencies, um, and then a third is dynamics, so that with Gadget Star, for example, we expect that the image is wobbling around um, because the accretion flow on the black hole is moving um, so quickly over time that um, we might have to generate a movie over a given night. So these are all sort of extensions to the framework that I mentioned before that we're working on VHT. Um, so in summary, um, the VLBI data is incomplete sampled, and so we need algorithms to infer a best guess image from the data. Um, two of these important imaging uh, algorithm classes are clean and RML. I mentioned um, imaging in all of these algorithms is path dependent, and therefore requires careful validation. Um, and there are lots of different open areas um, in the ESG collaboration in particular, um, ways uh, to explore and designing imaging techniques for the ESG and other VLBI arrays. Um, so thank you so much for, for listening. And if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to take them now. Thank you, Andrew. That was a very comprehensive uh, introduction to this field. So there are a couple of very interesting questions in the chat. I will read them out. But before that, I wanted to just clarify one point with you. So when you showed that the data are compatible with multiple images, and you have to pick some subset that you prefer, which is the philosophy behind the RML methods, the examples you showed, I mean, there were the good and the bad ones. The bad ones all had, I think, large negative intensities. Yeah. So my question is, is it sufficient to just say, I only want to look at images that have positive intensity, which is a very, very safe assumption. Is that good enough? Or do you really need all these additional knobs through the particular uh, regularization functions? Yeah. If you can say very shortly what you think on this question, I think that will be useful. Then I'll read out the other questions. Yeah, so I think what we found is that the positivity constraint is the most important constraint, and as you mentioned, the most like, easily easy to defend. Um, in a lot of cases, it is sufficient. I think for the EHT, um, working only with positivity, um, we can often get good results, but regularizing functions are often really helpful in um, helping us to get to um, the, the positivity on its own might produce images which are acceptable, but might also have a much higher rate of giving images that are stuck in local minima, for example, that have you know, ghost images, or extended structure that isn't negative, but is, is thrown all over the place. So it, you can get away with only having a positivity constraint for larger arrays with more baselines. Um, it might be all you need. For EHT, we found that we, the regularizers are often really helpful in getting reducing the number of local minima that we have. Very good, yeah, thanks. So let me read out a question. First one is from Macek. So he says that if you think in the Bayesian language, chi-squared is the log of the likelihood and the regularizing functions that you're using are like the priors. Mm -hmm. So he's asking within Bayesian language, what is the meaning of the various hyperparameters? Right, so I think in a Bayesian language, those hyperparameters would be fixed by, you know, the, um, the normalization of your different probability distributions. Um, so there isn't really a one-to-one -one example. We're giving ourselves more freedom in the RML case than we would have. So we wouldn't be able to adjust those parameters. Um, that's why I would say RML is Bayesian-inspired rather than actually Bayesian. Very good. Uh, so the next question is from uh, Frederick Jaron. Question is about averaging the images obtained from different methods. So the question is, doesn't this 
increase the number of systematic errors in the final image compared to any single reconstruction? Um, so I think one thing it definitely does is it means that our final image itself doesn't fit the data. Um, I think you could worry that the hope is that I think that and what we found just by looking at all of the different images uh, and different pipelines is that, that what we considered um, to be sort of untrustworthy or worrisome features in the images were not correlated between the different uh, imaging methods. And so averaging sort of removed, removes them. And, and, um, Very good. On and not in the other, it will, it will average out. If you have correlated issues that are present in all of your imaging likelihood uh, packages, that might increase them as well. OK. Next question from Christina Romero Canizales. If one station misses the scans of the calibrator because of, let us say, the elevation is wrong or whatever, can it still be used to produce the image of the target? Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the approaches that we're using here is not um, in the gain comparison that I was showing before, we weren't actually deriving. Um, so often what you might do in uh, a clean approach or where you have calibrators that are really close to your source, you're able to go back and forth between the calibrator and the source quickly is you might derive a solution for the gains on the calibrators and then transfer it use that solution that you've solved for um, on the calibrator and then apply it to the um, target. In this case, we're not doing that. We're just um, trying to see if the calibrator um, solution and target solution, which you've derived independently, are consistent. Um, so if you've missed one scan um, for calibrator or the target, there's no reason um, you can still use that scan um, and just verify if the overall trend is consistent. Very good. Um, question from this is Thomas Crickbaum, I guess. So he says, why is it justified to make images with higher resolution than the standard lambda over D? You know, that comes from physics. How can you make images that have higher, better resolution than lambda over D? Yeah, so this is a often um, discussed point, and I would say that the images that we trust the most um, most are those images which have been blurred to the full lambda over D, as in this image here. Um, but you know, uh, full lambda over D is just one um, is basically cutting out a circle in the UV space and saying that you know we don't have any data beyond this, and so therefore we know nothing about the data that lives in the Fourier plane outside of this. But really, that's not true. We can use the data that we have in the Fourier plane out to a certain radius and use that to infer at least some properties of data that we have. So we know, for example, that if the visibility gradient is decreasing at a certain rate, that it might be likely to continue decreasing at a certain rate. It's not likely to shoot up, right? So the data that we do have um, constrains certain features of data at resolutions that we, we don't have. But the degree to which that, that actually occurs is um, something we need to be really careful about. Great. So Angelo Riccarte wants to know about ALMA. Because ALMA has got so much sensitivity, it might uh, drive, it might you know, determine the image mostly from itself rather than all the other telescopes. So question is, what do you guys do about it in EHT imaging? How do you tamp down the strong influence of ALMA? Yeah, so this is a really good question. And um, so you're right, like the, the chi-squares that we have that we're trying to fit to um, might be dominated by, by ALMA because the error bars are so small in the ALMA measurements. Um, so often what is done in the clean approach is to um, use the, the so-called uniform weighting, which sort of ignores the difference in error bars between um, different sites, and then we'll let uh, the data from other sites um, uh, contribute as much as ALMA. 
Um, in EHD imaging, we found, and our methods, we found it's often useful in early stages of imaging to downweight ALMA, um, and then to, to increase the weight later so that we're really getting the full, um, the full information from the uh, error bars that we have. Um, in principle, you probably don't want to do that, though. So you want to try to find a, a solution that, that is able to fit the data to the, to the measured errors that you have. And so this is often a, a challenge. Um, but for convergence early on, often we will downweight ALMA. So, Rosie, do we have time for more questions? Because there are more interesting questions here. You know, we can go ahead as long as people want to stay online. There's no limit to the webinar. I did add the survey link in the chat window for people that do need to click off. But if Andrew has time, we can continue. Very good. Questions. Yeah, no, I think, I think the questions are wonderful and the answers are also very interesting. So here is the next question. Joshua Yao Yi Lin, thanks for the great talk. I was wondering whether if we approximate the clean beam as Gaussian, would RML have slightly better resolution compared with clean? Um, so I think this is a as this sort of relates to Thomas's question. Um, like I said, it's a topic um, that we, we look into a lot. I think um, some investigations I've looked at show that in cases of really good signal to noise, um, you can get increased resolution on um, RML that's not possible in clean because if you start to blur the clean reconstruction with smaller and smaller beams, um, so super resolution beams smaller than lambda over D, eventually the clean image will start to fragment into the underlying point sources. Um, and so, whereas the RML image is smooth, and so if you have a really good reconstruction that maybe has a maximum resolution of one half lambda over D, um, it's possible that your RML will get the data out to that resolution, but clean might, clean might not because the fragment into these point sources if you resolve if you blur with smaller beams. But I think it really depends on the details of the particular data that you're looking at. Um, the systematics that you have. And it really is important, as I mentioned, to do to do validation if you especially if you're trying to interpret um, super resolution features. Um, so to really do lots of validation on synthetic data um, with different methods as well. Okay. So let me go to the last question. I think we have to stop after that. So the question is, is from Alan Roy. During the RML minimization process, how do you generate the next trial image from the previous image when you're trying to go down the gradient to the minimum? Yeah, so one of the great things about RML, as I mentioned, is that it's a flexible framework and you can use basically any standard minimization uh, package to, to, to explore. That. So we're using gradient descent minimizers that are fairly straightforward. So basically we have analytic expressions for the gradients of all of our different regularizer and um, data terms, uh, chi-square terms, and we just sort of march down the gradient. Um, and the exact way that you do that, there's both there are many, many options um, of the exact way that you do that. Um, we're using currently in ESG imaging the EFSG algorithm, but um, there are many other ways you could imagine doing it. Really, just a gradient descent minimization. Okay, thank you, Andrew. I think, on behalf of all the participants, I would say thank you for a really interesting uh, presentation of the of the highlights of this field. And of course, we will hear a lot more about this in the summer school. Yeah, thank you all for, for coming and please fill out the, the survey. Um, I've also included links if you want to get started playing around with the HG imaging um, or with M87 data here on this. Please fill out the, fill out the survey in particular. Um, and thanks for listening.